asking questions and things of that nature, um, please make sure to clearly articulate your name and then um, the school that you're with. And then outside of that, if you could right now in the chat, we want to see what type of representation we have, because the goal and the idea is to outreach to all of the LA-19 community colleges. Um, so that being said, if you could in the chat, just really quickly, just put your uh, name and your college that you're here representing, um, that would be excellent. And we will get started here in about one minute because I do see a couple of people still logging on. Thank you, thank you. Welcome, welcome. We've got some great folks here on today. And Mariana Jose, you said we do have all of our presenters, our employer partners? Correct, Jermaine, they're on in attendance. Excellent. So we'll give it about a minute and then we will get started. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you. So once again, to those who might've just joined on, um, please, if you could put your name and your uh, college or employer or organization that you're simply uh, representing. And then in addition to that, just please note that this meeting is being recorded um, and it will be exclusively shared um, via the Los Angeles Regional Consortium and then also to the community colleges um, as well that this, uh, meeting or convening is intended to serve. All right. Thank you so much. And so moving right along, my name is Jermaine Hampton. I'm the Senior Director of Workforce Development and Special Projects here with the Los Angeles uh, Economic Development Corporation, Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation. Um, I also have my partners here with us today. Um, we have Larry Holt, who is the VP of uh, one of our VPs here at LADC. We also have Jose Palayo, who's the program manager of workforce. And we also have Mariana Hernandez, who is the assistant program manager of workforce development. So um, pleasure to be here with you all. Um, and, and really, so today's convening, I won't go through and read all of this right here, but um, really the idea here is to really engage the LA-19 community colleges um, in an opportunity to speak directly with um, our employer partners who are here on the call today. Um, LADC, we really focus on in-demand or high growth sectors. Um, everything that we do is fueled by our research. So our Institute of Applied Economics, who will be presenting some data here today as well. Um, and really the goal is to either A, enhance, um, but in some terms as well, um, create you know, new curriculum that will really prepare um, our students across the LA-19 colleges um, for the workforce. Um, we run a really build um, talent pipelines here in LA County, and that's one of the things that LADC does in terms of our workforce development. Um, so whether that's our unified school districts across LA County, um, whether that is our community colleges, our university systems, we want to connect our employer partners to these systems so that we can help engage um, and, and really inform the community about all of the opportunities. Um, a lot of times um, our community members do not necessarily know um, whether it's our students or just community members in general, don't necessarily know all of the opportunities um, that are here and present um, in LA County. And one of the bigger things that we wanna make sure that we do is we're develop, as we're developing those talent pipelines is that we're preparing folks um, for those, really those middle skill jobs that provide living wages, right? Um, family sustaining wages. We know that here in LA County, um, the living wage is upwards of $22 an hour. And that's just for one single person with no family um, to support. So that being said, that number obviously increases exponentially as you add individuals to a household. And so we want individuals to be able to flourish. We want them to be able to provide for their families. And so really one of those goals um, here today is to really talk and have conversations um, within the aerospace and defense uh, sector um, about what some of those opportunities are, those challenges, and how we can um, really merge curriculum or develop curriculum um, and even elaborate on current curriculum that some of the colleges already have so that we can properly prepare a workforce to go into so many different open opportunities. Um, we have some great employers here on the call today, and we'll get into who those are here shortly. Um, but for now, I want to pass it over to Dr. 
uh, McKeegan from the Los Angeles Regional Consortium. Dr. McKeegan. Thank you, Jermaine. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I, I just want to show my appreciation and collaboration and support of LAEDC, Larry, Jermaine, Jose, Mariana, and the entire team for really helping us to achieve our shared goal. A little bit about the Los Angeles Regional Consortium. We consist of the 19 community colleges in LA County. Our mission, as Jermaine um, stated, is along the lines of LAEDC is to bridge the gap between LA's workforce and employers fueling our cutting edge economy. Our objective is to address the skills gap by increasing availability of a well-trained skilled workforce in LA County. And this will not only close the supply and demand gap, but will also increase economic and social mobility for LA County residents and our students. Um, so I also wanna take this opportunity to thank Luke Meyer, our Center of Excellence Director, um, who's based out of Mount Sac at the Host College. And also I would like to thank our industry partners for truly your collaboration and commitment to our community college programs. Your partnership is invaluable in helping us to provide our students with the knowledge and skills they need to succeed in their chosen field. And to our LA 19 faculty and staff who have joined, I wanna express my sincere gratitude for your unwavering commitment to student success and for preparing them for their careers. Your contributions to our community and the education system are so invaluable, and I am grateful for everything that you do. So welcome, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. McKeesian. So I'll go ahead and introduce our industry partners. So first up, we have Dr. David Leo, uh, who is the Director of Talent Acquisition for the Strategic Space Systems Division of Northrop Grumman Space Systems Sector. In that role, Dr. Leo is responsible for all of talent acquisition within the Strategic Space Systems Division. And next up, we have Lisa Guzman Zairi. Um, Lisa is a senior contracts manager at Marvin Engineering Co. In her role, she works with various functional departments during proposal development and throughout the contract life cycle, which includes program management, supply chain, operations, production planning, quality engineering, manufacturing engineering, test engineering, global trade compliance, finance and accounting, business development, and legal, ensuring compliance with all customers' contractual requirements. Next, we have Angeline Benitez from Clark Construction. Angeline is a senior business development strategist with Clark Construction and supports strategic planning and development efforts in Southern California, including developing and implementing tactics to boost client engagement and collaborating with company leadership to identify and plan profitable new business opportunities. Next, we have Dr. Kim Armstrong. And she is the senior HR business partner for Boeing. Um, she also works with customer support engineering and the product support engineering function. In that role, Dr. Armstrong partners with senior engineering leaders to develop a culture of equity, diversity and inclusion and deliver high quality, seamlessly integrated HR support for the business. And now I'd like to introduce you to Max Dunsker, our research analyst at the Institute for Applied Economics here at LAEDC. And real real Hello, quick, everyone. Max, before, hey, Max, real quick before you get started, I did want to acknowledge for everyone, especially for our deans and presidents um, um, and also our faculty that are on the call, we do have a Lockheed Martin representative on the call as well, um, Steve McNaughton. And so while they will not be in necessarily speaking as part of the panel, um, they are here on the call for questions as well. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Um, before I get started, I also want to acknowledge the work of uh, Diego Saavedra, another research analyst at the Institute of Applied Economics who contributed to this research. Uh, so in looking at aerospace and defense in Los Angeles County, we've defined the industry within seven distinct NAICS codes. Uh, the first one is in regards to instrument manufacturing. Uh, the next three can be broadly thought of as pertaining to aircraft manufacturing and the component parts of aircraft. And then that third subsection, so the bottom three, have to do with guided missile and space vehicle manufacturing, as well as the propulsion units and associated parts. The next slide. So across those seven sub-industries, We've employed between 50,000 to 60,000 people in Los Angeles County over the last 10 years. 
Uh, for the first half of the last decade, so from 2011 to 2016, uh, we saw a gradual slide down to 50,000 employees. Uh, but in recent years, we have seen a rebound uh, with the current industry employment around 57,000 employees. Next slide. Over the past 10 years, though, we've seen a dramatic shift in the sub-industrial employment distribution across the industry. While instruments uh, and the manufacturing of instruments has remained the largest sub-industry by employment, we've seen aircraft manufacturing and its associated industries fall dramatically, uh, with aircraft manufacturing itself going from a third of employment to a quarter. Uh, in its stead, we've seen the rise of guided missile and space vehicle manufacturing in associated industries which rose to be a quarter of employment across the aerospace industry, up from an eighth 10 years ago. Next slide. One of the terrific things about the aerospace industry in Los Angeles County is the high average annual pay across the sub-industries. So compared to the LA County average of 66,000 per year, each of these sub-industries on average pay 20,000 more than the annual average wage. The highest paying sub-industries in the field have to do with aircraft engine manufacturing and the propulsion unit manufacturing for guided missiles and space vehicles. Next slide. Now looking at the change in pay over the last 10 years, we've seen differing outcomes among the sub-industries. While some have fallen slightly, uh, we've seen a large increase in the real wages given to aircraft engine and engine parts manufacturing employees, 158%. Uh, this increase has driven an overall increase of 6% in real wages across the aerospace industry. Next slide. Now we'll move towards looking forward in our forecasted employment. Um, so over the next five years, there is a small contraction that's anticipated in industrial employment of around 500 employees. Next slide. But just like with real wages, that's heterogeneous across the sub-industries within aerospace. Um, most notably, the guided missile and space vehicle manufacturing sub-industries are really anticipated to continue growing, uh, with 32% for the overall manufacturing and 42% for the propulsion unit and propulsion unit parts manufacturing sub-industries. These increases have largely offset contractions in the aircraft manufacturing and instrument manufacturing sub-industries, leading to a smaller overall contraction in the industry. Next slide. Now we'll look at job posting. And so over the last 10 years, we've seen a six-fold increase uh, from 2011, when around 5,000 jobs were posted, to this past year, where 30,000 distinct job postings were posted. The majority of those postings are in the instrument manufacturing subsector, 52%, uh, followed by guided missile and space vehicle manufacturing at 18% and aircraft manufacturing at 17%. Next slide. This now shows that data broken out over time in a line chart. Across the 10 years, uh, the instrument manufacturing sub-industry has been the largest sub-industry in terms of job postings, uh, but actually we saw a switch between second and third in 2020. Aircraft manufacturing became more common in terms of job postings than guided missile and space vehicle manufacturing at that time and has continued its growth. Uh, next slide. So this looks at the percent change to break down that data in a slightly different way. In 2012 and 2013, you can observe that there were huge increases in the number of postings in the space vehicle and guided missile manufacturing industry about 400% in the first year and 200% in the following year, as that industry grew in Los Angeles County. And notably towards the right-hand side of the graph, you see in 2022, we had a healthy rebound in job postings, uh, where we were seeing slight decreases in 2020, likely due to the pandemic. Uh, job postings have come back in full force. Next slide. So we'll look at now in the lens of job postings, the major aerospace employers in the county, uh, those are namely Northrop Grumman, Boeing, Raytheon Technologies, SpaceX, and Lockheed Martin. Next slide. This slide looks at the concentration of job postings among the top five companies in each industry. So these top five companies are not the same across the different sub-industries, but one common thread is the very high concentration of job postings for just a few major employers 
in each of the sub-industries. The only sub-industry which will see a balance uh, between the major employers and other employers, the other aircraft parts and auxiliary equipment manufacturing industry. But you can see that makes up about 7,000 job postings out of a total that is closer to 200,000. This breaks down for overall, so not just in the sub-industries, what we see in terms of the concentration employment by our major employers in the county. Northrop Grumman has represented 32% of the job postings uh, in the period 2011 to 2022, followed by Boeing and Raytheon with 14%, SpaceX at 11%, and Lockheed Martin at 7%. That means that only 22% of the job postings analyzed were from a company other than these five in the county. Next slide. Now we'll shift towards looking at demographics of the industry pulled from the census public use microdata sample. Um, what we see is a large skew towards older workers currently in the industry, while LA County at large is about 30% of workers under 24, 24 under, there's only 5% in the aerospace industry and more than 60% of the workforce is over 40 years old. Uh, next slide. In terms of educational attainment, we also see a very educated industry um, with only around 20% being at the level of having less than or a high school education. Uh, as a result, there's around 75% of workers that have at least some college experience or an associate's degree with more than 50% of workers having a bachelor's or higher. Then in terms of the racial and ethnic distribution, we see an overrepresentation of white workers in the current workforce. Uh, that overrepresentation then leads to an underrepresentation in Hispanic and Latino workers and black workers. And finally, looking at the gender distribution, the industry is heavily skewed towards male workers, representing about three quarters of the workforce, while there's relative gender parity uh, across all industries in Los Angeles County. So just in summary, or we can go to the next slide. Um, looking at occupations, and so these align with what you'll see in the presentation by Luke Meyer from the Centers for Labor Market Excellence, uh, Excellence in Labor Market Research. Uh, there are aircraft mechanics and service technicians, avionics technicians, and then assemblers and fabricators, and engineering technologists and technicians, except for drafters. Um, you can look more at this table in the PDF that's handed out, and so I won't go through every number, but in general, we're seeing, again, an overrepresentation of men in these roles. However, these roles are more accessible in terms of those with lower educational attainment and younger ages, uh, under 40, than what we saw in the industry at large, being a promising route for new workers. Uh, next slide. So just in summary, uh, across the industry in the last 10 years, we've seen large growth in the guided missile and space vehicle industry, a growth that is anticipated to continue into the next five years, and really buoy industrial employment in the industry for the county. We've seen a concentration of hiring in the industry among the major employers, who many of which are represented on this call, which is great to see. And then in terms of the workforce, we see a highly male, highly educated, and typically older workforce. Um, however, we've identified some roles where less uh, educational attainment and younger workers can have access and grow in the industry to eventually replace the high number of people that are likely to age out in the next 20 years. Um, thank you for your time and feel free to reach out with any questions. Thank you, Max. And now I'll go ahead and introduce our Vice President of Economic and Workforce Development here at LAEDC, Mr. Larry Holt. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Maliana. And thank you, Max, for a great presentation. Uh, I just wanted to talk briefly about what LAEDC is doing and why this program is so important to us. Uh, yesterday, I was at an event uh, sponsored by Boeing from the Edelman Trust Institute. And one of the things they were talking about was how there's an opportunity for business to build trust uh, by being public about their desires to reskill workers uh, and show that business is a, a partner for human success. And human success is, is what we care about here. Uh, our vision is a reimagined Los Angeles economy uh, growing, equitable, sustainable, and resilient with a healthy and high standard of living for all. Uh, this industry is so important. 
to the past and the future of the Los Angeles economy. And I'd like to thank all of our partners that have joined us here today. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you, Larry. And I'll go ahead and introduce Luke Meyer from the, from, uh, the Center of Excellence hosted at Mount SAC. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I will be brief. I'm going to be discussing the uh, supply side of things. So our programs related to aerospace and defense in LA County at our 19 community colleges with a uh, primary emphasis on the three program areas you see bolded there, aeronautical and aviation technology, aviation airframe mechanics, and aviation power plant mechanics. Now, uh, caveat with, with all these, these are the three program areas directly related to aerospace, but uh, I believe 18 out of our 19 colleges offer more general engineering programs, uh, whether it be electrical, mechanical, or, or um, other more general programs that provide a foundational um, you know, knowledge and skills and abilities that could be applied to aerospace. So while we're gonna focus on these three programs, uh, employers that are on the call, keep in mind that, that uh, the vast majority of our colleges offer uh, a foundational education in, in engineering. Go ahead, Mariana. All right, so focusing on those three program areas, looking at our students' trends over basically since 2012. Uh, there was one program that was discontinued, which led to a, a, a decline in enrollments in this area. But as you can see, since that time, enrollments have increased up to about 350 in the most recent academic year from those programs. Next slide. And these are the three colleges where there are, are concentrated at Mount Sac, uh, Mount San Antonio College, my host college, and then West LA. I saw someone from West LA on the call here. So I am by no means an expert in these program areas, but we report on all program areas. So uh, once we get to the conversation, uh, hopefully we'll hear from them to hear more about their program. Uh, you can see that over the last three academic years, students at Mount SAC and, and West LA predominantly. Thanks, Mariana. All right, so of those 350 students, um, about nine out of every 10 are male, which is reflective of the industry data that Max presented. Uh, and, and speaking of the overrepresentation of white workers in the industry, students in these pathways, uh, over 50% are, are Hispanic or identify as Hispanic. Um, and then in terms of age, about two thirds are 29 years or younger. So we have a young uh, uh, supply of talent at our, at our colleges. Next slide. Looking more deeply at those three program areas, you see them on the bottom there. These are the number of annual awards issued in those areas uh, over the last three academic years, along with the, uh, the average on the far right. So between these programs and then our, these general engineering programs, there are on average 500 awards issued from those. And this is, is not including, again, several other electrical engineering programs and mechanical engineering programs. Uh, there are quite a few at our colleges. that are just too many to list. Next. All right, looking at our students and how they fare in the workforce, Max was talking about the um, income potential and being higher in the aerospace industry than, than others in, in general. And as you can see in blue, are the employment outcomes for our students enrolled in aerospace programs versus uh, all CTE programs, all career education programs in LA County. And you can see pretty consistently with the exception of 2016-17 that students from these programs are working in their field of study to the tune of 95% in the most recent academic year that we have data available. Next slide. And again, Earnings, we see our students exiting these aerospace programs uh, outperforming their, um, their other, other student counterparts and, and on, on average across those earning just over $46,000 annually in the uh, latest year that we have data available. And the median change in annual earnings. So what this does is compare the uh, income from the unemployment insurance wage file for our, our students uh, prior to starting the program and then after the program, you can see a, a huge increase in students' uh, uh, wages in 2016-17, and that is that is, is tapered off to the tune of 38% uh, in the most recent academic year, still outperforming um, other CTE students on average. So it, it, it's a good 
investment, I, I should say, for our students to enroll in these programs. Next. And then finally, uh, students who attain the living wage, the portion of them. This is actually, because this data is uh, older, this, this operates on $18.10 per hour, uh, which, which is obviously lower than um, what Jermaine was, was referencing, which is, you know, with the recent inflation and whatnot, uh, above $22 an hour. But that $18.10 per hour is what this is based off of. So nearly 60% of students earning a living wage or above that amount uh, in the most recent academic year. So students are faring well in the job market from these programs. Uh, next slide, go ahead. These are the, the occupations that we're most focused on that Max mentioned, the aircraft mechanics and service technicians, the aircraft structure, surface, rigging, and system assemblers, excuse me, avionics technicians, and then the sort of uh, catch-all aerospace engineers and operation technologists and technicians. You can see the size of that occupation with 2021 jobs. The uh, projected growth for these combined four occupations is just over 11% through 2026. And we can see that there are more opportunities here uh, with, with about 760 average annual job openings. And all of the wages for these occupations uh, start off strong and only continue to get higher. So these are good opportunities for our students. Next. And then we looked at job postings. So uh, Max was focusing and uh, Diego on the uh, industry side of things, we looked at the job postings for these occupations specifically, and you can see the majority of them were for the aircraft structure, surface rigging, and system assemblers, followed by the mechanics and service technicians. And over the last year, there were just over 2,300 uh, postings total for these four occupations of interest. Next. Okay. And then with those four occupations, looking at job postings, you can see the job titles that came up most frequently from assemblers avionics technicians, the maintenance technicians, mechanics, et cetera. And then we have uh, the employers that are, are listing these job postings on the right. Some of these are our staffing companies. Um, so I'd be curious to hear from our employers how often they're you know, uh, getting candidates from those staffing companies or if they're finding them directly, it might be interesting. Um, all right, next slide. And then with those job postings, we looked at the advertised wage from March 22 to February of this last year. And as you can see, it's volatile as is, is common with job postings, but overall an increase of over $10,000 from this last uh, 12 months. So uh, higher wages are being advertised. And you can see the postings by city um, with, with LA on the left, Palmdale, Burbank, uh, unsurprisingly, a lot of these, uh, our, our employers are, are located in these areas, along with some um, airports and whatnot in the area. All right. Uh, so I, I promised to keep it quick. That was quick. If anybody has questions about these uh, slides, please reach out. Uh, if not, um, I'm interested to hear from our employers and our faculty on the call. Thank you. Thank All you. All right. Thank you, thank you. Go ahead, Mariana. Um, I was just gonna say, uh, we're going to open it up to the discussion now. So um, we'll go ahead and have Jermaine and Jose ask several open-ended questions to engage the conversation. Uh, feel free to unmute or enter your questions in the chat. Thank you so much. So if we could have um, our panelists, uh, Dr. Liao, Lisa, from the Marvin Engineering Group in Angeline and Dr. Armstrong, if you all could, if you could come off, uh, if you can go on video, please do so now. Um, if you can't, no worries. Um, and so, you know, in the kind of uh, with with time coming up, we know that we have the bios of all of these uh, panelists um, actually already in the program. And so, I think Mariana, did you share the uh, program lookbook already? If not, please do so. Um, so that everyone can see their bios. Um, that would be very helpful. Um, and then the other thing is we want feedback and we want this to be conversational, right? So um, if you have questions, you know, definitely feel free to come off mute and ask those questions or put it in the chat. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, as I kind of ask questions, you know, we want that feedback and, and kind of uh, being able to kind of collaborate and figure out ways that we can impact um, the students, right? And then impact, you know, essentially maybe curriculum, um, come up with some ideas 
um, and feedback so that we can kind of loop all of that together, document it, um, and figure out ways to move forward to help really build uh, those talent pipelines. Um, because I can tell you right now, just uh, doing some light research, um, the four panelists that we have today from Northrop Marvin and Clark and Boeing combined have thousands of opportunities, many of which um, they do not have the talent pipelines to fill. And so really the first question I wanna start off with, there's actually two, one is gonna be around talent pipeline development, but the first one is really around uh, trends. And so the first one, I'll just read it really quick so that everyone can hear. Um, what are the top emerging trends in aerospace and defense that the community colleges should know about? Um, so this would be information that they may not be aware of, um, kind of new industry practices and things that may be happening. So I'll start really quickly with uh, Dr. Liao, and then I'll go to Lisa thereafter. So Dr. Liao. Yeah, thanks, Jermaine. Thanks, everyone. Um, so in terms of emerging trends in aerospace and defense, I'll start with the one, one really big thing to keep in mind is aerospace as an industry encompasses both the aircraft side and the spacecraft side. And I think that's a really important distinction to make not just aircraft and spacecraft, but everything, all the components, structures, mechanics, as well as all the payloads that go on them, right? So um, as you look across the LA County region, um, you can sort of also see a distinction in location between aircraft and spacecraft. So I'll, I'll speak very generally, very broadly, it's not gonna apply to everyone, but a lot of the aircraft work happens up in the, the Antelope Valley, the Palmdale, Lancaster around Edwards Air Force Base. And a lot of the spacecraft work happens uh, closer to LA Air Force Base um, and SSC, Space Systems Command down here in the El Segundo area. So I think that's an important distinction to keep in mind as we're thinking about the, the very large Los Angeles metro area that we span. Um, and then of course, there'll be payload providers, including ourselves and you know Lockheed, Boeing and others, um, as well as uh, structural, mechanics, parts um, um, suppliers like Moog and others that are spread throughout the region as well. In terms of trends, it's a really good question. We're, we're continuing to grow very quickly as an aerospace industry, right? And you see that in a lot of the, the data and the metrics that were shown in the introduction. So it's a really exciting time to be part of the industry. Um, we're growing very quickly and that means we need a lot of the people, right? And, and our people are our best resource and our best asset. So it's really important to get that, um, that those uh, very skilled workers. And it's not just engineers, but also the technicians, the machinists, uh, the fabricators. So it's really, um, it's really important to get that entire wide diverse skill set. One other trend that we're seeing more generally speaking, not necessarily within the industry, is we're, we're seeing a net exodus out of the Los Angeles County, Los Angeles Metro and California regions as a whole. And that's really worrisome, right? Because that, that, that goes directly opposed to our need to grow. So I'll, I'll stop there, Jermaine. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Liao. And it looks like we have a question. I'll take this question real quick before I go to the next person. Um, JB? Yes, uh, good morning. JB Barakat, Employer uh, Coordinator Contractor with LARC. Technical difficulties, I can't bring my picture on today. Uh, my question, um, anybody you know from industry, please, if you can answer that, is that the difficulty of entering this industry is security clearances. Uh, so what is your take on that when we want to refer students? How long does it take for them to clear to work um, in your facilities? And is there any jobs that we can move um, with faster that do not require secret clearance? Thank you. Um, I can question. I can go, go ahead. ahead and and answer that. Um, yeah, so it's it's not a requirement for many, many opportunities that people can have working within the aerospace and defense companies. There are certain jobs or certain programs that do require that, but the majority, of the available openings and the jobs that we're looking for do not require a security cl clearance. So that goes as far as operations floor, supply chain management, um, contracts, compliance. Um, there are several functioning departments within all of these companies that do not necessarily require that secret clearance. 
Thank you, Lisa. Did any of our other uh, panelists want to talk, speak to that at all? Uh, this is Kim from Boeing. I will love to just add on the trends and on and uh, on the last comment that it is true. Even uh, within the Boeing company, we do also have uh, kind of a confluence of many jobs that do require clearances, but a lot of our workforce here also does not require clearances. Um, and uh, I will also add in Long Beach, they've had an explosion <laughs> that there's more than 19 uh, space companies that have, have uh, joined us here in Space Beach. So it's a very exciting time to be in aerospace because we have that mix of commercial support with our 24 uh, seven operations here in Seal Beach to our satellite facilities up in El Scundo, you know, and it, so it's kind of everything in between. I think also for a trend, and I think you mentioned this in the, the data earlier, we also um, really are looking in the best way to attract women and veterans into our workforce. And I think there's some really good things that uh, community colleges can do to help support that, especially with uh, veterans returning, uh, returning from their service and uh, women, especially uh, maybe women that have had a break uh, in their uh, employment. And we have several programs like return flight and things like that, where uh, we really would love to attract women and veterans into the workforce uh, when they're ready to come back. So those are a couple of things I would add. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. And so just keeping on the same topic of trends, I did want to get some uh, a response from Lisa and then Angeline after Lisa in terms of just trends. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here with all of you. So some of the trends that we're seeing are include zero fuel aircraft. Um, so uh, there is a lot of development in um, hydrogen fueled aircraft. And we're also seeing trends in advanced materials, um, composite materials. Um, we're also seeing trends uh, leaning towards additive manufacturing and 3D printing. And also um, with uh, the way we are posturing ourselves for the future, there is a lot going on related to supersonic flights and nuclear platforms. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. That's really good information. Angeline, anything you wanted to add in terms of trends? Um, I know you're coming from a different vantage point with uh, Clark Construction, so love to hear from you as well. Yes, so I think um, seeing for trends, and obviously we come from the construction side of things, but what we're think, seeing is that we work with a lot of like the aerospace community and um, clients, but we don't, and we're trying to hire in um, experts in, tr in understanding how to build these things, how to go out and talk to clients, how, um, what's the latest information that they have on uh, aircrafts and manufacturing companies. So um, we've been seeing that we are looking to, to do more of that type of hiring. Those are the trends that we're looking, um, that we're interested in. Um, we're seeing, uh, obviously I'm in Southern California, we're seeing a spike in these, um, with these clients and they're expanding and they're growing, but we are needing more um, students to help us um, understand that um, that market sector for us. Absolutely. Absolutely, thank you, thank you. And so kind of in the same vein, when we're talking about industry workforce trends, one thing that community colleges that I can note, you know, for several years have been really, really good at um, when it pertains to uh, new and emerging or really just in demand um, sectors, um, is the ability to quickly pivot and create and or enhance curriculum. Um, this has been something that has been done in multiple sectors for um, a variety of different occupations, obviously. So as it pertains to that, um, you know, I kind of want to get into some of the things that the individual organizations here that are on the panel are doing. Um, you know, I'll start with Dr. Liao in terms of uh, curriculum, really. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what do you guys have available or what can you bring forward um, to really help grow talent pipelines and, and leverage the community college talent. And real quick, Dr. Liao, before you start, I, I saw the question. I'll come back to the question right after Dr. Liao. 
Yeah, thanks, Jermaine. Great question. Um, we're really proud of the partnerships partnerships that we have built um, with our with our partner community colleges, um, both pre apprenticeship programs as well as apprenticeship programs. Primarily, um, Department of Labor um, approved uh, apprenticeship programs. I see uh, Juliana Kirby, um, who was a great partner of ours as well, um, on the call. Um, and so, primarily, it's focused around technicians. What we have to offer, Jermaine, is we have um, we have we have an understanding of the workforce need. We have the 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 space. We have the equipment, and we have the people to help uh, train and guide and teach as well. Um, and even in 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 something that we're trying to build um, here in 2023, we have excess equipment too. So as equipment continues to, to age, especially test equipment, um, that's that's uh, material that's surplus to us, but could be really valuable to to our community college partners. So we're trying to partner with our community colleges to get that over to them so that they can help um, train and build the workforce for the entire L.A. County uh, region. Um, so uh, and, and it, it, it's primarily technicians, machinists and machine shop um, employees. That's awesome. Thank you, Dr. Liao. I know that's something that came up as a really big topic in the bioscience program advisory we did, which was revolving around lab space, right? Um, we had a lot of folks with opportunities, employers that are um, one of their biggest challenges were students coming in and they have the knowledge um, and the understanding, but they don't necessarily have the hands on experience. And one of the challenges was lab space. Um, and so this is really great that uh, the equipment piece that you just brought up. And real quick, before I go to uh, I'll go to Lisa next. Um, Elizabeth, I think you had your hand up with a question. Elizabeth Bell. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Elizabeth Bell, Professor of Physics and Astronomy over at West Los Angeles College. I was wondering if um, there were any ideas on any industry specific training uh, recommendations appropriate to the community, co community college level, like we have the Aeros, um, the aviation tech program, but we're also looking to add additional possible certificate programs or degree programs. What do you recommend that we focus on based off of our communications today? So I, I don't mind uh, Ant taking um, part of that question and what a great question. So um, we're very big on standardized body of knowledge in several areas. And one of them particularly is um, the certified quality engineer. Um, it's a body of knowledge. Um, it is a certificate program and it's called the ASQ certified quality um, program. So you can look into that. Um, we're also very big on, there are cert certifi certificate programs for supply chain management. Um, it's the certified in production and inventory management program. Um, also, um, we've got the, um, the uh, project management body of knowledge um, we're finding that with good project management, we can get so much done um, with the tracking and the monitoring of, of large projects with, you know, hitting big milestones. Sometimes they're short term goals or, and we add long term goals to that, but a certified project uh, manager, a PMP. Um, is definitely a great resource to have. And what I wanna add um, about these different uh, certificate programs, th these are the kinds of things we can actually get high school students thinking about as they're entering community college and, and, and they do not require a four year degree. Okay, they may not even require the two year degree, albeit, uh, you know, education, we, we recommend it. And there, there are opportunities when you have those certificate programs to enter an organization, you can come in as an intern and work in a quality department, you can sit on a program and with the, with the skills, like with the PMP, you can help manage big projects. And it's interesting, um, we, we are looking for those technical skills, the assemblers, um, the, the team members that work in operations and electrical, um, but also team, uh, 
team members that can help manage the team and manage the projects. So um, I hope uh, I hope that answered um, your question. And uh, another, I'll just add one other item is dimension and tolerancing in our industry is really big uh, as well. So um, it doesn't, I mean, that's not rocket science. Um, it's the beginning and it's definitely something um, we'd like to see in the schools um, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, great question there, uh, Elizabeth. Um, and so real quick, move on to Angeline. I didn't know if you or Dr. Armstrong wanted to add anything here. Sorry, I uh, got interrupted right when you asked me the question. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah, no worries. Sorry. No, Sorry. just talking a little Somebody bit about- Somebody walked right into my office. Sorry. <laughs> No worries. Just talking about uh, curriculum development and really um, just looking at, you know, kind of talent pipeline development. Are yeah. there any things uh, that, you know, in terms of curriculum or um, occupations that you guys have a huge need for that maybe uh, the community colleges could direct, you know, kind of directly um, impact yes. those 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 pipelines with curriculum or enhancing current curriculum? Oh, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Uh, and apologize about that. Totally embarrassing. Um, several things. Um, uh, AMP licenses are always ones that are value added, uh, not only for uh, uh, community college uh, students, but also for uh, folks that are already in the workplace. Um, that's always that's something I've found many of our uh, even our engineers have. They like to go back and get that AMP license or the pilot training uh, elements. It's very value added in our workforce uh, and having that coming in. Um, also uh, other areas that are still really, really, really critically important are all of the CAD CAM systems and the analysis tools uh, that go along with that. Uh, we have a, a huge need to continue to develop in that space for designers, draftsmen, which, you know, everybody, <laughs> not really a draftsman anymore, but our, uh, our tech data designers and, and folks like that really critically important. Um, you know, also things, uh, you know, systems thinking, so kind of getting out of the, the real detailed things. Project management is critical, systems thinking, um, systems engineering, all those elements. So it kind of runs the gamut um, uh, with that. So those would be some of the things that I would su uh, suggest that we continue to focus. But uh, bringing back the AMP curriculum is is one that that always is uh, very active. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. Um, Anthony, please go ahead. You have a question? Sure. Um, to just build upon as as far as the analysis tools that we were, were just recently mentioned, can the panel just chime in on various platforms outside of CAD and CAM that? would be areas of focus that we could embed uh, within our curriculum? It's a, a great, great question. I know MATLAB is always a po super popular one, all those pieces that go with that. Um, I, I, that's what I would offer. I, I'd have to, I'd have to go back and double check which ones are super popular, but I think any, you learn any of the analysis tools, um, that'll get you a really good foot in the door. I'm sorry, could you reference the platform again one more time, please? Your audio is a little choppy. I apologize. Uh, Mat MATLAB? Did you catch that? Maybe that may be a little proprietary to what we have going on. Sorry. MATLAB? Okay, thanks. Yep, thank you. Good stuff, thank you. Excellent. Um, yes. I'll add another one. Um, I would recommend um, any type of uh, learning on enterprise resource planning systems. So as manufacturers, um, we use ERP systems to build our product um, and all the way up to completion and, and selling it to our customers. Uh, so that would be um, definitely, and there, there, there are several uh, different, um, there's Oracle, there's SAP, um, there are, you know, a lot of platforms out there 
Um, but understanding how those operate in a manufacturing um, environment um, is a, an excellent uh, body of knowledge to, to know when you're getting out there in the workforce. And because, you know, I mean, we, we spend a lot of time training uh, new team members on our system. Um, and and, and a, sometimes we get fortunate and have people come in and they actually have already worked in the system. You put them in front of, you know, the computer and they, they hit the ground running and, and that's excellent as well. Thank you, Lisa. We had another question in the chat that I wanted to make sure we caught from John at LBCC um, said, would cybersecurity uh, professionals be an area of need for companies represented in this meeting? Um, so cybersecurity, could any of our panels kind of speak to cybersecurity needs essentially? I don't mind taking that question. Um, yes, uh, cybersecurity um, is a, a big uh, requirement um, being flowed down um, as a government contractor. Um, our, we have had to uh, meet uh, several uh, levels of compliance as it is related to cybersecurity. And um, that is another functional area of our company, which is IT. Um, which is managing all of our cybersecurity compliance and ensuring that everything we do every day within our computers um, is protected uh, because we are a government contractor. So yes, um, it's definitely uh, uh, something um, in a potential employee that we look for as in terms of the knowledge um, in helping us to uh, meet our compliance. That's excellent. Um, Dr. Liao, did you want to add anything there or Dr. Armstrong? Yeah, no, Lisa, Lisa spot on. It's a, you know, cybersecurity is a, 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 a I'll say embedded requirement um, and, and needs to be, you know, part of everything that we, we work on. Um, so there's absolutely a need for it. Um, and it, it, it's a part of everything that we do. Um, so yeah, we definitely have a need for it. It's, I'll just say, can we probably not as large as some of our other areas? Yeah, I agree from from Boeing. Even even in our highly skilled uh, technicians that work in the simulation space, that's a, a key new certification that everyone needs to carry. Excellent, Luke. I don't know if you know offhand. I I, I want to say just what I'm thinking is maybe all of the colleges, with the exception maybe one or two, have cybersecurity certificates. No. Yeah, I'll, uh, the folks from Long Beach that are on this call uh, can speak to their program, uh, which is which is recognized. And then there's several others that have cybersecurity programs from Pasadena, LA City, Rio Hondo, Cerritos, El Camino, LA Mission, Pierce, um, and Mount Sac in West LA, who's also on the call. So yeah, uh, a strong presence in cybersecurity for sure. Absolutely. Luke, thanks for the plug. So I'll just jump in. Uh, we are one of two or three colleges throughout the state of California who have the designation of a center of academic excellence for our cybersecurity program. And that was vetted through uh, NSF as well as the DO, uh, department, DOD. And so, um, you know, really rigorous. And then we're hoping to build upon the great work that we have. And then Dr. Armstrong mentioned it. The other thing that I would love to hear from the panel on on. It seems like the, the role, the skill set of a, a technician, that's evolving in itself. A relativity space over the weekend attempted to deploy their first 3D printed rocket. I believe they're um, they're going to be successful hopefully in the next day or two, but that that's uh, something that's ever changing, ever evolving. So I'd really love to hear about, we touched upon platforms, but what, what does the new technician, what, what does that look like? Uh, in, in this new uh, additive manufacturing that had been referenced earlier. Would love to know some of the new skills that we can keep current with, with the trends and where the industry is going from the standpoint of uh, additive manufacturing and beyond. So I just wanted to throw that out there as well. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, Dr. Liao or Dr. Armstrong or Lisa, did you wanna kind of chime in there on that, that question from Anthony? 
Well, I can definitely tell you that uh, aerospace and defense, uh, our industry is among the largest users of additive manufacturing um, technology. And um, the, there's a, a, you know, we have quite a bit uh, happening um, in that arena. So I'm very glad to hear that you are incorporating that into um, your curriculums. There's, de there's opportunities there. Excellent. Yeah, and I agree. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in just real quick and say sure. another trend that's happening, um, not only in the additive space, but it's really interesting to see sort of the, the connection between sort of the more traditional and the new kind of compute computer interface in a lot of our technology. So for example, simulators um, uh, or anything of that nature, there's still a need for like highly skilled technical employees that know how to, you know, turn a wrench, if you will, and repair and fix and troubleshoot. Troubleshooting is a big piece. But the 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 new kind of computer front ends of these things, we're seeing technicians that need to come in that come in with a different set of skills where it's computer science background and, and things like that. So it's it's really an interesting time right now in that space of what you need to come in with and what we're looking for. Um, just thanks. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. Yeah, um, and um, oh, Jermaine, I, I just wanted to add that uh, with the, the 3D printing and the additive manufacturing, um, you know, there uh, are, we're replacing obsolete um, aircraft parts with 3D printed parts. Um, we, we, we're also seeing, um, you know, building various, uh, you know, structures, um, you know, I mean, you hear it from, from bridges to shelter systems um, with 3D manufacturing. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, there, there's a lot going, going on there. Uh, not that we do this um, at the Marvin Group, but um, they're, they're, they're using uh, additive manufacturing to improve spacesuits. So uh, that's an that's, uh, interesting uh, tidbit as well. Absolutely, thank you, thank you. So we have a couple questions in the chat. Also in the chat, I did put our link to Clark Construction's Aerospace and Defense page. Um, our representative from there had an emergency. She may be able to jump back on, um, but just wanted to put that link in there. And if you have any questions directly for them, um, feel free to visit that site and we can take your questions directly, Mariana. Hernandez can. So in the chat really quick, um, one question, and this is for any of the panelists, um, would a general engineering technician certificate with a one-year college training uh, education, would that be good? Would that be a good starting point essentially for positions that you all have open? And that can be any of you. So, can probably yeah. That. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll take a, a, a cut at that. Um, Good question, Kami. I think we always want to, I'll speak very honestly. I think we always want to think about this as supply and demand, right? Will that, will that person with a general engineering technician certificate and a one year college training education be, you know, the, the most competitive candidate? I think we could, I think there would be other, you know, people with uh, more experience, you know, have more, more training, et cetera. That that could be more competitive. So I think it's a good starting point, right? To your question, but the, the more the more the more experience that they have, the more you know um, skill sets, training, whatever it is, makes them more competitive. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Liao. Elizabeth Bell, you had a pretty lengthy question. I want to make sure we get it right. Did you want to come off of uh, mute real quick and just ask your question directly? Uh, the one about the computer programming? Uh, yeah, programming languages, et cetera. Yes. Oh, yes. So um, I understand, I, I've been in aerospace as well. I understand there's proprietary computer programming languages on the job training, but my students have been asking me, are there particular electives or particular programming languages I should learn for a particular company? Or is there a, a highly representative type of computer language that is, 
is needed within like the larger aerospace companies represented throughout the region? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a really good question, Elizabeth. Um, good, good to see a, a former North and Grove employee on the call. Um, so I think when you think about the aerospace and defense industries, right, well, we're very different than the, the, the Google's, Twitter's, Facebook's, et cetera, of the world. We don't do pure software development, right? What we do primarily is software that integrates with hardware. So for us, um, for at least North of Grumman and, and the work that we do here, um, primarily it's embedded systems, embedded software um, development. Generally, it's C and C++. Those are our, our most commonly sought after software skills, right? It's when software, you know, uh, software enabled hardware. Um, and then in addition to that, and I think a little bit uh, parallel to it, is uh, the digital hardware design. So it's the FPGA and ASIC. Um, and that's prime a lot of hardware, but there's definitely a, a large software component to it too. Thank you. Good stuff. Good stuff. And Dr. Liao, while you're off of mute, um, another thing I kind of want to throw out there. I know that we LADC we did a visit up there at your facility um, in Palmdale, and one of the things that came out of that conversation was also um, some of the the certificate program. I think there's one already available. Um, at Antelope Valley College. Could you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about what's going on at Antelope Valley? Because I know the biggest thing that came out of that wasn't necessarily that college. It was more so the fact that Antelope Valley can't fill all of the opportunities that you have. And that's not just Northrop. That it goes for Boeing. That goes for um, our other panelists on here as well. Lockheed Martin, who was on the call also. Yeah, I, I think Antelope Valley College has a really unique, um, uh, I'll call it an opportunity to partner with the uh, with the um, with the uh, companies out there in, in Palmdale, Lancaster, et cetera, um, because it's a it's it's a I'll, I'll, and, and for, forgive me it's a it's a bit of an isolated geography, right? And um, one of the biggest challenges that we all have, I believe, as employers up in the Antelope Valley, Antelope Valley is keeping people in the Antelope Valley. We have great success in you know drawing uh, young engineers and technicians and machinists into the region. Um, into the, the Palmdale Lancaster area, but um, they tend to to leave the Palmdale Lancaster area after a number of years. So um, Antelope Valley College, having more of a resident population from Antelope Valley, um, has a really good opportunity to have students that uh, and that turn to employees that stay stay longer in in that uh, micro region. Um, so to, to answer your question more directly, Jermaine, we do a lot of um, specific you know technician certificate upskilling programs with Antelope Valley College. Absolutely. And so what I did for everyone on call, I did put that in for um, some of our faculty that are on the call to look into that program, because I do know um, one of the big things that came out of that conversation is the need to expand upon that program and maybe maybe uh, essentially, you know, uh, have it adapted with other colleges up and down the region so that they can fulfill um, some of those talent gaps. I know one of the, the last kind of quotes thrown out to me from another Northrop representative was something like 19,000 job opportunities, not just necessarily in LA, but nationwide. Is that is that correct, Dr. Leo? Yeah. Yes, that's 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 accurate, Jermaine. Perfect, perfect. Um, so Dr. Armstrong or Lisa, is there anything else you guys wanted to add really along the lines of like technology, AI and equipment needs? Um, and, and maybe some of the software needs that folks, I think, or did we kind of cover everything there? I, I feel like uh, uh, David Lau, he, he did a good job um, of uh, explaining um, some of those interfaces um, and, uh, you know, in different software. Um, what I wa wanted to add um, to uh, Ms. Bell's question was, uh, teaching about um, coding and um, fi financial financial reporting um, is another uh, big uh, talent that we look for here um, within our organization. And especially um, when you look at uh, government contracting and different contract types that are out there, 
without getting into each one. Each one requires a different type of financial reporting. So that is also, you know, something that maybe uh, you could bring into, uh, you know, your college um, curriculums. I know that a lot of our, you know, top management, um, executive leadership and functional leadership, you know, we lean on um, that, that those financial reporting to ensure compliance to the types of contracts you know, that, that we are uh, receiving here within um, the company. Um, we, we refer to them as, as T-codes and, and, you know, specific types of T-codes tracking up to um, top level projects and looking at the financial uh, health of a particular program. I just wanted to add that. Excellent, thank you very much, Lisa. So right here, we got about uh, maybe about 40 minutes left. And I know we've had a lot of engagement. We've actually covered several of the questions. I wanted to pass it over here um, to Jose Palayo, um, our Workforce Development Program Manager, um, just to add a couple more questions around workforce gaps and talent pipeline um, and kind of go from there. And then, you know, please keep the, uh, the engagement and, and the questions coming. Thank you, Jose. Yeah, thank you, Jermaine. And once again, thank you to the employer partners for participating, um, as well as the colleges who are engaging such important conversation. Uh, but as Jermaine mentioned, I wanted to touch base on such an important topic, workforce gaps. Uh, and it's such an important topic because workforce gaps gives you an insight on the entire workforce. You know, it improves recruitment efforts, uh, brings opportunity for reskilling, but also prepares the companies for the future. Uh, with that being said, I want to ask, and I'll start off with Dr. Armstrong, uh, do you have an upscale need for your current workforce that the community colleges could provide? Um, thank you for asking that. I think that um, there's there's always um, opportunities for the community colleges to engage. I think I mentioned earlier, um, A and P courses are always something. Um, you know, pilot training, flight training, is an area. Um, any other types of things like language training is always value added, writing, um, you know, how to write better, I guess I would say. Yeah, somebody put in the chat, uh, CATIA training is always value added. So I, I think the, 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 the gamut of things that the community college provides today, uh, programs like Boeing have very generous, what we call our learning together program. And it does uh, afford folks to go and get additional certificates uh, to continue to stay sharp in, in different areas. So um, I think the last one I'd add is probably project management is always a good one for preparation to take the, the, the PMP or the PMI exam. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. And it seems um, throughout, I know Lisa mentioned that PMP is also a very um, a need uh, in regards to rescaling. So I actually want to segue to Lisa to see if she has anything to add. You know, uh, something, you know, that I think um, the community college, first of all, I just want to say you, to all the community colleges represented here today, thank you for everything that you are doing to help this emerging uh, generation of potential workers, hopefully a lot of them in the aerospace and defense industry. Um, what you're doing um, to coach them and to mentor them and to ensure them that their success is important to the advisors and the people that are working hand in hand with them so that they can stay in Los Angeles and live out their dreams right here. Um, so I, I really want to thank you for that. Um, uh, I think uh, that we, there has to be um, good uh, pairing between the student when they're entering the colleges. And again, um, I think I said this before, we need to start in high school, okay? We need to start hooking them when they're in high school, recruiting them into the colleges and hold, basically holding their hand 
every step of the way, not letting them go and, and, and keep engaging them and talking, talking to them. And that comes from the, the advisors that are there in the community colleges that are letting them know what's available, what are the opportunities, you know, for them, you know, after they, they leave the, the, the college. So, um, uh, that is, um, I, I think it's that human factor. It's the communication um, helps close the, the, the gaps. Um, it's the mentoring, it's the coaching. Um, I think that that is a big part of it. Um, we, we can, you know, throw out, you know, fancy names of, you know, certification programs and everything, but it's, it's gonna start with the bond that is created between um, the student and, and the advisor as well. Um, it's something I, I wanted to share. I just wanted to add, you know, I am born right here in Inglewood, California. Um, and I myself um, wish someone hooked me when I was in high school. And when and then I when I got into community college, I went to community college myself. I went to Santa Monica College, and then after that, I was on a roll, and I ended up graduating from USC. Um, however, this, that success had to do with people and advisors that I was working with that cared about my success, and they pushed me. They pushed me. They, uh, they said, you have potential, okay? What do you like to do? What Are you interested in this? Are you... so? Um, thank you for letting me share that. Um, I think uh, that human factor is a big one in closing that gap. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, you know, I agree the great work that Alark is doing in, in the community colleges in regards to, um, you know, helping these students. And I actually want to segue um, to another question that was actually put in the chat by Cami, uh, is what would be entry skills that a new hire should have? And if I want to kind of touch base with some of the things that you said, Lisa, if you can touch base on some of the soft skills as well that, um, you know, have been are crucial uh, throughout any industry. Uh, but I actually would like to go with Dr. Leal first and have his input. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I think it's a great question. I think it's um, it's a I, I think it's very it's very broad. Right. So it's going to be very. Uh, depending on you know the the type of role that you're going into, the, the entry level skills are going to vary very significantly depending on that job. I think very broadly speaking, right, what we're looking for is someone that's a lifelong learner. Um, I think I think uh, Dr. Armstrong, you know, mentioned Boeing. You know, I think I believe you guys call it learn learn together, right? Um, I think each of our organizations is looking for people that are willing and want to continue to learn over the course of their career. Because if you just think back over the last 10 years or so, right, how far we've come as an industry, as a nation, and the new skills that we're learning. Um, it's, it's someone that, you know, wants to learn, is willing to, to, to persevere, work hard, work diligently, um, and, and, and wants opportunity and is going to go out and seek it. And it's really, I think, all of us in the aerospace and defense industry, one of the biggest things that we do is we're very collaborative, right? We work very closely together, and you've got to be able to work in a team environment. Thank you, doctor, uh, for your feedback. Um, I actually want to segue to Dr. Armstrong to see if she wants to add anything in regards to soft skills that we're looking for in regards to these college students. Mm, thank you. Yeah, I, I would add, you know, some some basics around, um, you know, showing up on time. I know I hate to say this, but showing up on time, you know, be, being prepared. Um, you know, I, I think the basics, good basic computer literacy, um, you know, something specialized and unique, obviously you'll get that on the job, but, you know, not to be afraid of technology, which I think in this day and age is probably a given that I think for everyone is probably pretty comfortable coming in uh, with a computer and or a smartphone or tablet or the, the basics of that. Um, I think, you know, having basic good communication, basic math skills is helpful. Um, you know, wanting to work in a team environment, but being comfortable working independently. And then I would add those those other things like being able to think systemically, uh, being creative. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I would add that. I think those are some of the some of the basic things that that are that are good to have coming in. But 
you will get a lot of specialized training when you come in. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. A key point that you pointed out is being tech savvy, which is a major um, skill that's needed um, across um, the industry, I would say. Uh, so I want to segue to Lisa to see if she has anything to add. But thank you, Dr. Armstrong, and Dr. Leal, for your input. So as far as the soft skills, um, communication, uh, listening, problem solving, knowing how to collaborate, um, working in teams, um, leadership. Uh, we, we like to see, you know, emerging leaders. And um, when we see um, their potential, um, we start to um, pair them up with uh, certain, you know, individuals um, for their growth and their development. Um, so they like, you know, continue um, growing uh, within uh, their, the organization and um, we cre creating um, development programs for uh, any, any skill sets that we, we see in, in, you know, in, a, in a young emerging uh, leader uh, will develop, do a development program to um, you know, set them on the path uh, to success. Um, definitely, um, some we like to see people, you know, being proactive um, about their their own growth and development as well. Um, but uh, those, you know, those uh, would be um, some some of those uh, soft skills. Because you know what we do in our industry, they are big projects, and it is never a one man show. It is a team um, of you know, fun from all different functional departments within an organization um, that gets the job done, so. Thank you, Lisa, agree with you. Um, teamwork and be able to communicate is always an important skill. Uh, I actually wanna segue and touch base more on what Jermaine mentioned earlier. Uh, wanna recognize Northrop and kind of touch base more. So the California Community College Association for Occupational Education recognized Northrop and their partnership with Animal Valley College uh, because they're one of the few colleges in the United States who offer uh, fabrication and repair. Uh, within that being said, uh, I want to touch base and, and go with Dr. Leo to kind of ask, how are you currently working with the other community colleges to build equitable talent pipelines? Uh, if so, um, can you please explain further? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And, and thank you. Thank you for that, that recognition. Greatly appreciate it. Um, many, many kudos to our our team um, up in Palmdale for for, build, for building that amazing relationship with with uh, AVC up there. Um, I'll, I'll give um, a couple examples. Uh, two of our um, other community college partners are El Camino College as well as uh, LA Pierce College. So El Camino College being um, uh, our, our neighbors here in the South Bay um, and very close to uh, our space park sites in Redondo Beach, Manhattan Beach, um, as well as El Segundo and then LA Pierce College. Um, in close proximity to, to our Woodland Hills facility. Um, so uh, amazing partnerships there, building uh, talent pipelines, right? So those are the pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs. Um, but also on top of that, um, our, our, our charitable uh, arm, our Northrop Grumman Foundation, um, gives to the, um, the, 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 I'll call the, the diversity and inclusion, diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, um, very specifically the, the, the MESA program at El Camino College, and that's when we work very closely with to provide opportunities for for students um, uh, that a absolutely need it. Um, on top of that, we're really proud that there are a number of Northrop Grumman employees that sit on the El Camino College Foundation uh, Board of Directors, um, and and we do that in order to support the, the the mission of the college and the foundation. Thank you, Doctor. Um, I actually want to pass it to Jermaine, who has his hands raised. I know he wants something. Yes, I'd add. Thank you, Jose. Dr. Liao brought up an, two things I wanted to highlight, pre-apprenticeships and apprenticeships. Um, those are huge in the state of California and they're funded very well. Um, it's an, they offer great employer incentives, but then in the back end, um, it's a tremendous opportunity to develop talent hands-on. Um, and there's multiple ways that that can happen. I know that there's some apprenticeship opportunities already going on with Northrop. Just wanted to see from Dr. Armstrong and Lisa, I know Clark Construction has um, multiple apprenticeship opportunities as well. They're not, they had to jump off the call. Um, but Lisa and Dr. Armstrong, are there any apprenticeship opportunities that you all currently have as well? 
or are you open to apprenticeship opportunities? Because that's another segue as well. So um, we do have um, a, an internship program. Um, typically, um, we um, are taking um, interns in um, who are, I believe, typically in, in a four year um, program. Uh, so, and we have had um, some great success stories where they have, they do continue on um, after receiving a four year degree with Marvin Engineering. Um, some and many, while they are going towards um, uh, becoming like a first, second, or three level uh, mechanical engineer. Um, as far as these, uh, the, the, Pre um, uh, apprenticeship program, I think that is definitely uh, something um, that we would love to hear more about and 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 work with the colleges and and see what that that looks like. Um, and I, but what I will tell you is we are um, very much engaged um, with some trade uh, schools um, in in the local area. Um, where we have uh, people who are learning about um, uh, electromechanical assembly, um, cable harness assembly, and um, we keep in touch with them. And then um, we offer uh, job opportunities um, when, when they um, complete the program. Awesome, Lisa. Uh, Dr. Armstrong, did you want to add anything there? Um I agree. I think I would be really curious to learn more about it. Um, I'm sure there are uh, opportunities where, where that might make sense um, in some of our different areas. Um, but we too have a very uh, robust internship program. We even have uh, opportunities in high school for some summer experiences. Um, and so, uh, nope, uh, I think she summarized that perfectly. <laughs> Perfect. And so one thing we can do, you know, aside of just convening employers and um, faculty here across the LA-19 is we can certainly uh, help liaison and, and be that, that guiding force to really facilitate a lot of this conversation, working with the Department of Economic Opportunity, also the city of LA as well, um, in terms of pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship opportunities and developing those opportunities. Also on-the-job training opportunities as well, which is a whole separate um, key component that I think can really be helpful um, with all of you as employers, um, but then also leveraging those that student talent um, and getting them into an opportunity is where it's not just an internship, but it's a paid opportunity that turns in really to a direct placement, right? And so you're really just investing at a higher level in the talent, um, and that really helps build those equitable pathways. And that really starts, I think, to a lot of folks' point um, at the at the uh, high school level, and so. Um, LADC, we're currently working um, and bridging a lot of those gaps and working in collaboration um, with the Los Angeles Regional Consortium as well um, on those efforts. And so really quick, just wanted to bring up, I know Larry Holt has a question, um, and then I'll pass it back over to Jose for maybe one final question, and then we'll just take some kind of closing questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jermaine. Um, Lisa mentioned she was raised in Inglewood. And I would highlight that I've been in California four months. So um, uh, if this question is um, obvious, I apologize, but is there industry collaboration happening at the R&D level here? Uh, is that <clears throat> something we as a economic and workforce development community could support? Uh, that's which I was thinking about that after reading Dr. Bell's question uh, in the chat around other areas of collaboration and I don't know if she was, uh, Dr. Bell, if you were getting at capstone projects, perhaps, but um, uh, I think there's a lot more opportunities for us to continue to support uh, the growth of this important industry. Thank you, Jermaine. So, yeah, yes. I'll, I'll... Oh, go ahead. Go no. ahead. No, no. <laughs> um, I, yeah, it's a good question, Larry, and, and welcome to the, to, to, to the LA region. Um, in terms of R&D collaboration, I think you're referring to R&D collaboration between industry and the community colleges, right? Either uh, collaboration, you know, there's the famous Sheffield plant that um, uh, Boeing runs that offers a chance for 
uh, lots of supply chain collaboration on R and D because R and D so uh, uh, so critical for innovation in the industry uh, is actually what I was thinking of. But it, uh, there was higher level collaboration taking place with higher ed uh, that would be valuable too. And I just think it's important for us as a community to um, think about. Um, all parts of the ecosystem and, and supporting that. Yeah, so in terms of higher ed in general, we, we collaborate very closely um, when it comes to research and development um, with higher ed. Um, they're, they're a very critical partner to us um, in terms of developing new technologies and bringing uh, technologies into uh, prototypes and products that we can, we can uh, produce, right? So absolutely. Um, and I'll, you know, not to go into too much detail, but I'll, I'll use, I'll, I'll, you know, generally higher ed helps with lower TRL technology, technology readiness level um, um, products, and then we usually take it from higher TRL levels. And that's usually through, you know, whether it's unrestricted grants or, or um, more directed research. That's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Dr. So uh, before I segue into my next question, I saw in the chat Elizabeth had a quick question, uh, which states, are there opportunities for related but non-engineering majors such as physics? Um, so I'll open it up to, to the panel to answer that question. Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> and more, more, uh, more and more in other areas. So absolutely. Um, Everything, human resources, finance, supply chain, uh, all different ones, all different ones, even in some biology fields and computer science, uh, et cetera, runs the gamut. That, that's one, I will just say, that's one of the amazing things about being in this company. I've been here, it'll be 35 years in May. If you can think of a career field, there is a career here for you, uh, literally nurses, doctors, engineers, scientists, um, you, you can you can do it and you can move around. I started as an engineer and now I'm in now I'm in human resources. It's it's uh, it's amazing what uh, these these large companies uh, have opportunities for. I, I can't say enough about all the companies that are on the call. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. Uh, do the other panelists want to add anything uh, to the question? Uh, I would add um, that you do not even have to be an attorney to show your value in a company um, and helping them meet all the compliance uh, needs within uh, the organization. Um, that is uh, that that is a large um, uh, body of knowledge. Um, we we work with the defense of federal acquisition regulations uh, and understanding um, business systems compliance, accounting system uh, compliance. Uh, you know, a lot of what we do. Um, you know, we are audited through the defense contract management agency and we have team members all around the company um, conducting internal audits and ensuring you know compliance to um, all of the uh, regulations of uh, federal and local and state uh, reg regulations in, in meeting that compliance so I, I will add um, that is um, another uh, field of interest um, that would you could add to your curriculums, in, in the community college in preparing a job opportunity um, for someone coming out, possibly even with an AA degree. I mean, we'd have to see what that looks like, but it could be an opportunity there. Thank you, Lisa, appreciate that input. Um, I'll allow uh, Dr. Leal to add anything uh, or if it's been summarized and I can segue to the next question. Yeah, I think, I think uh, Dr. Armstrong and Lisa will answer it well, thanks. Thank you. So uh, I want to bring up one, one last question before we open it up to uh, general questions as well as to any questions that were presented in the data. Uh, we still have our Institute of Applied Economics who can answer any questions regarding that. But a very, very important question. Um, do you have any systems or programs in place to ensure you have access to and are cultivating a diverse workforce? 
Uh, I actually want to go with Dr. Armstrong, reason being, I know preliminary meeting with Boeing, they discussed the need for uh, veterans as well as women. So I would love to kind of see where they're at, as well as if there's nothing in place, how can the community college help recruit those uh, diverse uh, populations? Oh, great question. Yes, um, I did mention we do have several uh, programs um, and uh, um, and I'm not going to repeat those, but there's there's also um, I, I think in terms of help is is I think it does continue to be the question about how do we attract uh, women uh, in, into into the field. I think that continues to be uh, the big question um, that we all are faced with. So if anyone has any good ideas, definitely. Um, but, you know, one thing I do often think about uh, is, you know, the connection of the community college, not only with the business, but with local uh, workforce, uh, workforce boards, right? So I know LA County has several, Long Beach has Pacific Gateway, uh, there's also Celica, there's, there's lots of them. And, you know, that, that, that's also a great kind of part of the partnership, I think. Um, and maybe there's some ideas on, on how we can connect the dots uh, all together um, and continue. Yeah, there's seven great. And that doesn't even include our friends in Orange County because technically my office sits in Orange County. So we also have Orange County that can be part of it. And, uh, but nevertheless, I think that's, that's where, where I would go. But, you know, in terms of disconnected workers or folks that, you know, for whatever reason um, in their life took a break, whether it's to be with a military spouse traveling the world, um, I know I've spoken to many uh, where their their spouse is transitioning um, out of the military and, and looking for work. I know I've worked with several and helped connect them into great aerospace jobs because they do carry those clearances, which makes them very attractive. Um, and then the training, uh, I think that's another thing the community college could do is helping the veteran connect the dots into industry language. I know that's always a, a barrier there um, or a confusion point is how to translate military speak into to business speak. So I'll leave it there because I could just keep going on this topic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. Uh, Lisa, do you want to add anything to the conversation? Yeah, so um, we, what we do at Marvin Engineering and um, speaking of uh, getting women into the workforce, I want to introduce uh, two of uh, our team members from the Marvin group that are on the call with us. Alejandra Villa and Joanna Villa, which are our recruiters at Marvin Engineering. And I just wanna thank the two of you um, for your support and, and being here today um, with all of us and, and giving me this opportunity. I, re I really appreciate it. So um, what we're doing, so we get out there, we're putting our, um, our job postings on different job boards, we are attending different job fairs. Um, we have um, been in collaboration um, with a US vet, a different US vet uh, organizations. Um, we have uh, also have close collaboration right here in Inglewood with our with the Inglewood uh, Vets organization, as well um, as the fact that um, going back to compliance, you know, we um, have, we fall under, you know, the affirmative action programs, which um, ask us to ensure that we are showing diversity within our organization, not only within the organization, but within the functional departments. And so um, we, 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 make um, it known the different opportunities we have. The challenge is, is the applicants. And this is what we're talking about now. And I think what it comes down to is, is um, just, you know, spreading the word and encouraging, you know, encouraging um, young, uh, you know, uh, females, and different, you know, socioeconomic uh, backgrounds and different cultures, you know, that uh, there is an opportunity for everyone out there if, if you have an interest. 
um, and the opportunities are there. And again, what we can do to continue encouraging. Okay, again, I'm going back. There's a lot of that, uh, you know, that coaching, that mentoring, um, letting, you know, letting people know that um, there is a, a growth path for them and opportunity right here, you know, in Los Angeles, California. Thank you, Lisa. I actually want to echo the great partnership that Alejandra and Joanna have been, as well as the other partners. Um, so we hope to build that and, and bring opportunities directly to the community college students uh, in the near future as well. So I actually want to uh, segue to Dr. Luis Al for his last comments regarding the question. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a really good question. And I, I think Dr. Armstrong, Lisa, covered it really well. Um, it, it's really important to continue to grow our, our diverse pipelines that we have and also um, continue to grow our people once they're within our organizations, right? And when you look at the, the data, oftentimes it looks like, um, and, and depending on how, how you cut the data, a lot of, I'll use that as, as an example, females in the workforce tend to sometimes uh, leave the technical track at a higher uh, clip than men do, right, in the a and industry. So I think there's um, a lot of opportunity there um, but to, to Dr. Armstrong Lisa's point, you know, um, we, we, we have programs that help um, help uh, people return to the workforce that we call the I return program. Um, and that's one that um, uh, disproportionately affects some of the demographics that um, we're, we're, we're much shorter on. Um, and then we have a lot of programs with our veterans, um, especially at our, our partner universities, um, as well as with, throughout the industry. Um, we're a partner of, of the DOD Skill Bridge program to help transitioning service members um, as they exit uh, the service um, to move into industry. Um, an amazing program that's through the Department of Defense, um, and we partner closely with Operation Impact. And then once again, talking about our, our colleagues in, in Palmdale, um, they, they started a, a program um, helping uh, homeless veterans uh, find uh, careers into industry and paths into industry. So we, we continue to grow those um, programs, especially in our local communities. Thank you, Dr. Lau. You know, it's amazing all the great work that the different employer partners are doing in the community. As mentioned, we'd love to build more uh, to bring these opportunities to the community college students. There's over 500,000 uh, students within the com community college district. So uh, a lot of work that still needs to be done to bring these opportunities. But again, thank you so much. And one of the key things that I that I heard from all the employer partners is the open openness and willingness to work with the community colleges, which is great. Uh, but with that being said, I will segue it to our senior director of workforce development, Jermaine Hampton, uh, for closing remarks and any um, questions. Absolutely, thank you all. And so, really want to thank all of our partners um, on the call today, the Los Angeles Regional Consortium, obviously all of our employer partners on the call today, and absolutely all of the college representatives that we have here. Um, bringing everyone together to collaborate on these types of conversations, what they do is they lead into additional opportunities of collaboration. And so that's what we really want to drive here with these types of meetings. As I kind of, you know, spoke to before, I mean, the colleges in, you know, collaboration with industry partners have developed tons of curriculum. Right, and that curriculum then provides opportunities um, that are really equitable across um, the LA region for our for our you know community members and our folks that are going into the community college system, um, and being able to leverage that talent and put them directly into opportunities and or transition them into even higher education is is huge, um, and all of that really starts from an intentional approach of leveraging um, really the unified school districts, right. Um, and encouraging them and letting them know and informing them about all of these industries and about all of the opportunities that are here in LA County. Um, I can tell you right now, you know, LADCs, we've, we've went into the community, we've done focus group sessions um, with underserved youth. And I can tell you right now, while someone may understand or know what computer science is, they do not know what aerospace and defense is, right? They do not know what bioscience is. They do not know what the ocean economy is. They do not know that Allied health professionals is a new occupation within the healthcare sector that has a huge need um, for people, right? They do not have this information and their parents don't have this information. And so one of the things that LADC does is we bring that information um, to the community and we make folks understand all the opportunities that are out here in the community. And we most importantly connect industry 
uh, with people um, and essentially build those that talent pipeline. Um, in the chat right here, I just put in a few different things. Um, I put in our workforce development information. I put in our research, our events at LADC. Um, also put in our partners at the Los Angeles Regional Consortium. We want to make sure that you guys have access to that information as well. Um, and then also our economic uh, forecast report. Um, great information for everyone to take a look at to help inform um, a lot of the things that are going on here in the region, not just in aerospace, but across all uh, the in-demand or high growth sectors as well. And so with that being said, you know, I want to thank everyone on the call. Um, we do have technically um, 17 minutes left. So um, is there any other questions, any other just general comments um, from anyone on the call for our guests or just folks that just want to have some words to say? Now will be the time. Anthony, you came off of mute. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure. Um, one, one of the, you know, I part I have the fortunate pleasure of participating in a number of these, both local and, and regional advisory board committee meetings. And, and I want to first and foremost thank everyone for their time. It was it was quite informative. Uh, there are so many um what I like to label as gray areas that are not tech specific, but there are still career pathways and career opportunities for our students to pursue. So that that information was was very useful and I'll bring it back to the folks here to hopefully develop some uh, programming that is uh, reflective of, of those opportunities. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to just highlight and see if there is any level of interest is that we talk about uh, demand in these various sectors and these various um, disciplines and but the, and then we talk about program development and curriculum development. So when those elements are in place, I, I believe the the industry partner, the partnerships that we have, but but more for from an active engagement standpoint, where they are actual uh, participating in the cultivation and the grooming of these future employees. I think that's a helpful and a missing component, at least for us in in various programs that I help oversee. And so we had mentioned apprenticeship programs. So we have a a key industry partner in the EV space uh, as of late. What I would like to do is replicate that and really build that out in, in the areas of advanced manufacturing, welding, all these, all these programs that have, I believe, to Dr. Armstrong's point, transferable skills, because that's, because that's where you start doesn't necessarily mean that's where you're going to end. But I, the, the missing component that I would like to solicit for those who are interested is really um, being a, an active and engaging partner to really help cultivate and groom folks. We have a workforce development department here on our campus. We work very closely with them. They offer great workshops from the standpoint of resume development, you know, mock interview skills, what have you, the, those key touch points or those key points, building blocks to really, hopefully, when you reach that level of engagement with them, they're fully vetted, they're fully fleshed, but I believe the the real world application that you all are 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 providing that's that's a that's a element that I think that's going to be really helpful for them, and so they can have all the theory, they can have the application within a community college environment, but actually how things go on in your ecosystems and how to have that. Uh, innate culture of team building and the ability to communicate with with one another or with new people effectively and efficiently. Those are things that I think need coaching for many of our our students who are first time college goers or they are not legacy uh, students from the standpoint of they have an older brother or sister that can pass on that information of what it is to persist and successfully complete a program and then go on and and successfully obtain employment in their area of study. So I know that's a lot to unpack, but my 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 bottom line ask is. If uh, you all would be interested in mentors for, for these folks, you know, we, I, I believe we have a good system as far as identifying the, the, the talent and then maybe developing a cohort model. And, and then from there, 
you know, you can really engage with them and, on various touch points, whether it's like breaking bread and having lunch, right? We can share box lunches and then you all could talk about and get to know these, these, these very deserving individuals on a more personal level. And then also, you know, you, you find that they'll find a champion in you. And then hopefully, you know, that incentivizes them to pursue and complete and be successful. But also, hopefully you have a, a person that's a really great fit for all the cultures that you have uh, built into your ecosystems as far as your, your, your entities, businesses are concerned. So I'll pause there. Thank you all. Thank you, Anthony. So I, that was a a nice ask, and I, I think it's definitely something that, you know, all of our employer partners are here and interested in. So I know that will be a conversation to continue. So we're happy to, you know, initiate that and make sure that that happens. Um, I know we have another question here. Dr. Young, um, did you want to go ahead? Yeah, I did have a couple of questions. First of all, again, I want to echo the sentiments shared by the other uh, folks on this call. Thank you for the presentation, your participation this morning. Uh, two questions that I have was one, for the opportunities mentioned at the various employers, does that do you have opportunities to formally incarcerate or system impacted uh, previously system impacted person persons? And number two, are the occupations that are available within your organizations uh, is it a necessary to belong to a labor union or a trade union to get into those occupations? Sorry, sorry, Mike. Sorry, can you repeat? Uh, can you repeat the first part of that question again? Yeah. Uh, formerly incarcerated and system impacted, those folks who have uh, been part of the criminal justice system who are now uh, out, are there opportunities for individuals who have those, uh, have, have something particularly in their background that are looking to overcome and reinst re re reinstated in society? And also the second was, uh, is it necessary to be a member of a labor union or a trade union for the occupations that you have at the technical level within your organizations? Yeah, it's a great question, Mike. Uh, um, so for the first part of your question, we, we are looking at and, and discussing a few programs um, that we were aware of um, that uh, well, one specifically that comes to mind is um, um, people that are formerly incarcerated or incarcerated that are getting trained in welding, right? And that's a, a major need of ours, especially in our in our commerce site. Um, so we, we are definitely looking at those programs, Micah, um, and just, you know, big picture, um, uh, big picture. Um, because of the work that we do, right? They require not just background checks, but a lot of the work that we do requires security clearances. So it depends heavily on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on what that prior offense is, right? Um, and so hopefully that, that helps a little bit. And the second part of the question is, are these unionized or trade union, labor union positions, or are they just with the company, within the company? Um, this this is Kim. I, I can say it it depends on the location and it depends on the position. So um, uh, many, many of the uh, highly skilled manufacturing employees do belong to the labor union. Um, we have great partnerships with those. Um, our engineering population and other office workers are not except in a few very specific locations of our company where they have a uh, jurisdiction. So it's 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 a it it all depends on your location and your job. Yeah. And just to elaborate a little bit, Dr. Young, I can kind of speak firsthand um, to our partners here on the call and even Clark Construction who had to hop off. Um, all of them practice what they preach. Um, I've visited both uh, just in specific to give you two examples. I visited Clark Construction. I've worked with them in DC, Atlanta, and here in California. And then also the same thing applies with um, a visit that we just recently did at North Green Grumman. Um, they had returning citizens there that I actually spoke to firsthand, um, younger folks, in, in fact, um, that had recently uh, essentially begun working for them and went through some on-the-job training there um, and then merged into favorable careers, which they were very happy about. I mean, I was excited just to see um, a couple of young men that were working on fighter jets and I forget exactly which fighter jet it was, Dr. Liao can probably help, but literally working on fighter jets directly um, out of high school. Um, and they took a certificate program and then merged into those, you know, those opportunities. So whether it's our young people, whether it's adults looking to upskill or reskill our veterans, um, and then also returning citizens, I can assure you that every last one of these employers practice what they preach. 
they, Dr. Liao just put it in there, the F-35s. Yes, that is it. Luke, did you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Jermaine. Um, no, really just a comment. Um, I just wanted to say, so preparing uh, data for this, this advisory here, uh, focus specifically on aerospace and aviation programs. And I realized I greatly undersold our community college programs, talking about the transferable skills from manufacturing to, uh, um, David just mentioned welding. A lot of our colleges have welding programs. And as any organization needs, you, HR came up, um, you know, administrative assistance. So, uh, the lookbook, what is in there is not an exhaustive list. We offer over, you know, 150 different career education programs. So um, don't take that list as limiting. There are several more uh, programs that would fit your hiring needs, I'm sure of it. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Luke. Definitely. So always want to highlight those uh, kind of skill sets that are transferable skill sets that can um, then help individuals merge into various opportunities with our employer partners across multiple sectors. Um, I know we'll be doing a hiring event later this year um, in partnership with the LARC um, that is going to highlight a lot of these opportunities and provide um, direct, um, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, collaboration with the employers on this call amongst others um, and our community college students, especially those that are graduating from programs this year. Um, so that's going to be an awesome opportunity to put folks directly into positions, internships, apprenticeships, um, and then even, you know, some of our higher education folks that for those that want to continue their education um, and get bachelor's degrees, master's, et cetera, be opportunities for them as well. So all wonderful things. Um, so that being said, I mean, if there's no more questions, I'll give everyone six minutes of their day back. Um, you know, I want to thank everyone again for this call. We, I think we got up to uh, roughly 44 um, call, uh, individuals that participated in this call across multiple um, colleges. So thank you all. Um, this information and recording will be made available. Um, and we'll also have notes and a recap. And then also, obviously, um, the program lookbook has already been dropped into the chat. And maybe, Mariana, if you want to drop it in there one more time really quick for those that might have joined us late um, so that they can have access to that information. Also, anybody that has questions for, for anybody, you know, please feel free to send those questions directly um, to mariana.hernandez at ladc.org, um, and she'll happily get back to you um, and ensure that your questions are answered. And so once again, on behalf of the LADC, thank you to our partners and everyone on this call, and have a good rest of your afternoon. Take care.